Thanks for tuning in to the next video of deep learning. So what I want to show you in this video are a couple of limitations of deep learning. So you may wonder, are there any limitations? Are we done yet? Aren't we learning something here that will solve all of the problems? You can build a machine that learns to solve more and more complex problems, a more and more general problem solver, then you basically ha have um, solved all the problems, at least all the solvable. Well, of course, there are some limitations. For example, tasks like image captioning yields impressive results. You can see that the networks are able to identify the baseball player or girl in pink dresses jumping in air or even people playing the guitar. So let's magnify this a bit and look at some errors. Here on the left you can see this is clearly not a baseball bat. Also this isn't a cat in the center image. And there are also slight errors like the one on the right hand side. The cat on top of the suitcases uh, isn't black. Sometimes there are even plain errors. Like here in the left image, they, I don't see a horse in the middle of the road. And also um, on the right image, there's no woman holding a teddy bear in front of a mirror. Um, machines in their mathematical intelligence far exceed most people already in their ability to play games. They far exceed most people already. In their ability to understand language, they lag behind my five-year-old, far behind my five-year-old. So the reason for this is, of course, there's a couple of challenges. And one major challenge is training data. Deep learning applications require huge manually annotated data sets. And these are hard to obtain, they're time consuming, expensive, and often they're ambiguous. So as you've seen already in the ImageNet challenge, sometimes it's not clear which label to assign. And obviously you would have to assign two labels or a distribution of labels. Also, we see that even with the human annotations, there's typically errors. And what you have to do in order to get a really good representation of the labels, you actually have to ask two or even five experts to do the entire labeling process. And then you can find out the instances where you have a very uh, sharp distribution of labels. These are typically prototypes. And broad distributions of labels. These are images where people are not sure what is actually shown in the image. If we have such problems, then we typically get a significant drop in performance. So the question is, how far can we get uh, with simulations, for example, to expand training data? Of course, there are also challenges with trust and reliability. So verification is mandatory for high-risk applications, and regulators can be very strict about those. And they really want to understand what's happening in those high-risk systems. Regulators pay dis disproportionate amount of, to, of attention to that which generates press. This is just an objective fact. Um, and Tesla generates a lot of press. End-to-end -end learning essentially prohibits to identify how the individual parts work. So it's very hard for regulators to tell what part does what and why the system actually works that well. And uh, we must admit at this point that uh, this is largely unsolved to a, to a large degree it's difficult to tell which part of the network is, is doing what. Modular approaches that are based on classical algorithms may be one approach to solve these problems in the future. This brings us to the future directions. And something that we like to do here in Erlangen in particular is learning of algorithms. So for example, you can show that the classical computer tomography uh, which is uh, expressed in the filter back projection formula here, where you have a filtering uh, along the projection direction and then a summation over the angle in order to produce the final image. Uh, so this convolution and back projection, they can actually be expressed in terms of linear operators. And if you go ahead, you can see that they are essentially matrix multiplications. Of course, we are building on all these um great abstractions that people have invented over the millennia, such as matrix multiplications. Now those matrix multiplications can be implemented as a neural network and you essentially then have an algorithm or a network design that can be trained towards specific purposes. So here we extend this approach in order 
to apply it to fan beam projection data. So this is a slight modification of the algorithm and there are cases that cannot be solved like the limited angle situation. In this image you see a full scan and this produces a reasonable CT image. However, if you're missing only 20 degrees of rotation, you already see a severe artifact. Now, if you take the idea of converting your reconstruction algorithm into a neural network and retrain it on some training data, here it's only 15 images, you can see that even on not seen patients, we are able to recover some of the lost information. Now, if you look at the top part of this image, you can see that there is a reduction of mass. We show line plots following the red line in the left image on the right hand side. Now here in um, green you can see the reference image that is largely unaffected. As soon as you introduce the angle limitation you end up with the red curve which shows uh, this artifacts in the top part of the image. And now if you further go ahead and take our deep learning method you end up with the blue curve which largely reduces problems that have been introduced by the angular limitation. Now the fun part about this is because our algorithm has been inspired by a traditional CT reconstruction algorithm, all of those layers have interpretations. They are linked to a specific function. What you typically do in such a short scan is you weigh down rays that have been measured twice such that the opposing rays exactly sum to one. You can see that here in the Parker rays in this figure. Now if we train our algorithm, the main part that changes are the Parker weights. And what happens is that we can see an increase of weight, in particular in rays that run through the area that has the angular limitation. So the network learns to use the information from a slightly different direction in those rays that have not been measured. You can even go ahead and then combine this reconstruction method with an additional de-streak and denoising step. And as we will show towards the end of this lecture, is that we can dramatically improve also in the low contrast visualizations. Here you see an image of the full scan reference on the top left, uh, the neural network output on the top right that still has significant streaks, and on the bottom right you see a streak reduction network that is able to really reduce those streaks that have been caused by the angular limitation. And compared to a just denoising approach on the bottom left, you can see that those streaks would be diminished, but they still would be present. And only such a trained method that understands what the problem is, is actually able to reduce those artifacts efficiently. So next time in deep learning, we want to look at basic pattern recognition and machine learning, which basic rules are there, and how this is in relation with deep learning. And then we want to go ahead and talk about the perceptron, which is the basic unit of a neural network. And from those perceptrons, you can build those really deep networks that we have been featuring in this and previous videos. So I hope you liked this video, and it would be really great if you tune in next time. Thank you.